Welcome to the University of Michigan Dentistry Podcast Series, promoting oral health care worldwide. movie will illustrate the procedures to be included in the initial or hygienic phase of all periodontal therapy. The patient has advanced periodontal disease with a bluish red discoloration of the gingival tissues. Moderate to deep periodontal pockets are present. The periodontal status is indicated on this chart. The free gingival margin is related to the cemento enamel junction and the area between the free gingival margin and the bottom of the crevice or pocket is marked in blue. The field of operation is flooded with iodine lotion, which also is deposited in the periodontal pockets with a blunt needle syringe. Excess iodine is absorbed with a sponge. The curette is the most versatile instrument for scaling teeth and should be used wherever access for it can be gained. Scaling is performed with short deliberate strokes while maintaining a definite finger rest. The scaler is periodically dipped in iodine lotion during the procedure. In deep or intrabony periodontal pockets where deposits are tenacious and access is poor, a hoe should be used to remove the subgingival calculus. Periodontal files are excellent instruments for smoothing the cemento enamel junction and for the initial reduction of gross roughness on the root surfaces. Following the use of periodontal files, the root surfaces should be planed with a curette or a sickle type of scaler. After the completion of the scaling and root planing, iodine lotion should again be applied into the periodontal pockets to minimize the hazard of post-operative infection. The scaling procedure will now be demonstrated on the central incisor. First, the operative site is flooded with iodine lotion. A sickle scaler is used to remove the labial and interproximal calculus. Care must be observed to avoid forcing calculus into the supporting tissues. The cemento enamel junction and root surfaces are smooth with a periodontal file, first on the distal side and then on the labial side. Even if no discrete particles of calculus are present, it is desirable to freshen the root surface by planing. Obviously, a thorough familiarity with the contour of the gingival attachment is essential before commencing the scaling and planing procedures. The tooth surfaces are again planed with a curette or sickle scaler. 
removal of contaminated cementum and dentine, in addition to removing local irritants, prepares the root so that new cementum may be deposited on the freshened surface. Reattachment and adaptation is most likely to occur on a clean, smooth tooth surface. On the palatal side, either a jacket type of sickle scaler or a small curette may be used. Special attention must be paid to the cemento-enamel junction and the interproximal surfaces from the palatal aspect. After scaling and root planing, the tooth surfaces are checked with a number 17 explorer to assure that all calculus has been removed and the tooth surfaces are smooth. The instrument should be placed into the gingival crevice with its tip flat on the tooth. Then the tip of the instrument is turned toward the tooth to feel for irregularities. Iodine lotion is again applied to the field of operation. The remaining teeth are also scaled and planed in a similar manner. When sufficient access is available, narrow, medium, or fine linen strips may be used to further smooth the interproximal surfaces. A contra angle holds the rubber cup which is filled with polishing paste. This is used on all the teeth. The thin borders of the rubber cup make it possible to polish slightly under the free gingival margin of the teeth as demonstrated here in the anterior region. Although the rubber cup is extended interproximally as much as possible, it does not provide adequate interproximal polishing. This is especially true in the mandibular incisor region. An orange wood stick or port polisher can be used interproximally and for the cemento enamel junction. Polishing paste is first placed on the teeth. Then the polisher is moved up and down and extended into the gingival crevice as deep as possible without causing discomfort. The open spaces between the lower incisors provide excellent access for the port polisher. Notice the position of the fingers and the firm burnishing type of action that is used. A new polishing contra angle which provides a back and forth action of the tip has recently been introduced for polishing interproximal surfaces. It is called the EVA system for prophylaxis and can be attached to a regular handpiece. The tapered triangular plastic tips have a series of cross-cut grooves to hold polishing paste. Different size plastic tips are color-coded. Here, the instrument is used on the interproximal surfaces of the mandibular incisors. Again, the polishing paste is first applied to the teeth. The instrument can be used from the lingual or palatal aspect equally well. 
polishing paste of various particle sizes can be used. However, a very fine paste should be used to provide the final finish. The back and forth action of the polishing tip is shown here as it is held against the maxillary cuspid. There is also available a very thin diamond coated tip that can be used with this contra angle for the removal of overhanging margins of amalgam or gold restorations. Polishing must follow the use of the diamond abrasive. The most common method for interproximal polishing is the use of dental tape and polishing paste as shown here in the mandibular incisor region. This is somewhat time consuming but is effective in polishing the interproximal surfaces of teeth. After polishing has been completed, a disclosing solution is applied to the teeth. This will reveal any residual plaque and surface stainable areas of decalcification. The solution is applied to the mandibular teeth first to avoid dilution with saliva. Then it is applied to the maxillary teeth. After the patient has rinsed his mouth with water, it is evident that the root surfaces have absorbed or retained some stain from the disclosing solution, indicating the need for additional polishing. The patient is also instructed in detailed home care procedures. This, however, is the subject of a separate film and will not be demonstrated at this time. The lingual and palatal surfaces, as well as the labial and buccal surfaces of the teeth, are carefully checked for residual stain. When the patient is recalled following the completion of the scaling, root planing, polishing, and instruction in oral hygiene, his gingival tissues are re-examined. Note that there is no gingival bleeding from probing and the gingival tissues have become much more firm and dense. This improvement applies both to the free and attached gingiva. Also, note the gingival recession and improvement in gingival form. However, there are still residual pockets in the bicuspid and molar areas. Note the firmness and good contour of the gingival tissues in the right bicuspid region. Disclosing solution is again applied to check effectiveness of the patient's oral hygiene. There is retained plaque interproximally in areas of exposed root surfaces. The patient, therefore, is given additional instruction in oral hygiene. In this instance, a soft toothbrush and rotary scrub method is demonstrated. This method of brushing is shown without the use of toothpaste to make it easier for the patient to visualize the action of the bristles of the toothbrush. The patient is also re-instructed in the use of dental floss for the interproximal areas which he had not cleaned efficiently. 
Here, a floss aid device is used to hold the dental floss. Notice the interproximal polishing of the teeth with the floss. This can also be done without the device by holding the dental floss or dental tape with the fingers. The patient should be thoroughly instructed to polish the interproximal surfaces with the dental tape or floss. Upon completion of the hygienic phase, the pockets are recharted to determine if there is any need for surgical elimination of residual pockets. Notice that there are only a few pockets deeper than three millimeters. When the new chart is compared with the original chart, it is apparent that several of the initial pockets have been considerably reduced in depth so that they now are within physiological limits. It is also apparent that attached gingiva has been gained. For example, in the mandibular incisor region, a deformity which initially appeared to need mucogingival surgery has now been eliminated. The patient is now ready for occlusal adjustment and periodontal surgery in the maxillary molar and bicuspid regions prior to replacement of the lost molars. Comparison between the patient's periodontal status at admission and upon completion of the hygienic phase shows a marked reduction in gingival inflammation, improvement of gingival contour, and reduction of crevice depth. You've been listening to a presentation from the University of Michigan School of Dentistry, which is dedicated to supporting open learning and open educational resources. This recording is licensed under the Creative Commons. It may be reused and redistributed for nonprofit use. Please attribute materials to the University of Michigan School of Dentistry and redistribute under this same license. For more information on how this and other University of Michigan School of Dentistry recordings may be used, visit www.dent.umich.edu/license.